We entered the house. The whole house was shaking because it was being pounded within the walls. In repetition. Oh, the walls? Right. Yeah. Like, boom, 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 wow. boom, boom. And the furniture had been flying around for weeks. The family had fled the house. When we went upstairs, I looked in the bathroom. The crucifix in the bathroom was turned upside down. Like this? Yeah. Yeah, wow. just like out of Hollywood. And I'm hearing growling and scratching coming from inside the walls. Where are you living, Chris? Uh, it's Colombia. called um, Jardín de Antioquia. It's uh, about 40 kilometers from Medellín, four and a half hours by bus. Although I'll admit, I also miss the food in Mexico. <laughs> It's better food in Mexico or in Colombia? No, I, I miss Mex real Mexican food. <laughs> real Mexican food. Yeah. The I, real, ta I, the real taco. In, I lived with a Mexican family and this sweet old woman, the mama of the house. Every single morning, she would be running around trying to figure out, what can I make for Chris today? It was oh. so much fun. It was wonderful. I, I, I meet you with Alma, Alma Rayas. That's right. It was her mother. Okay. Okay. Almita, it's a really nice person. Yes, she is. Yes, yes she is. Well, I, I'm going to make you the questions, Chris, and we going more naturally. Okay. okay. Well, you tell us about your background. Who is Chris McKinnell? Who, who am I? Uh, yes. I'm just a person trying to understand my purpose in the world, trying to understand why we're all here, what, what's the meaning of life. Um, and how can I help people the best I can while I'm here? And uh, when I was about 10 years old, I started questioning things. You know, I mean, obviously, when your grandparents are on television and they're going into hauntings and dealing with the church and everything, I was going to Catholic, Catholic school and I was taking um, catechism, learning, so I could prepare myself, but it didn't fit my 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 beliefs so i started okay. studying other religions then i started going on lectures with my grandparents by the time i was 16 and ready to go on my first case i had no idea what i was getting into okay the world is so much more mysterious than we really understand you know human beings like to identify everything we like to put names on everything And we like to believe we understand everything, but we're constantly learning. That's the reality. Science yes. is a process of learning constantly. Not that I consider what I do science. I think science is a fantastic tool, but it's not. It's the not ultimate tool. It, it, it's not enough. It's just yes. one tool that's in the tool bag. You've got to look at other ways of looking at the world. For instance, when you're doing a psychological study, it's rarely what anybody would call scientific. Yes. It can be rigorous, it can be disciplined, but human behavior isn't easily replicated. I can't push one of you and get the same reaction from every single person I push. It's not replicating the same way. That's what the paranormal is like. I can go into a haunted house a hundred times and have a hundred different experiences. So I don't mind people who don't believe in the paranormal. That doesn't bother me at all. I think it's a great protection. But I also think that it's a shame that you, you blind yourself. Yeah. I think we're all born psychic and people are taught not to see. We actually have, in, you know, I run the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research, which carries yes. on the work of my grandparents around the world. Uh, it's something that my grandmother and I started right after the first movie came out. We okay. just realized we needed to expand our mission. And I had been in the Peace Corps in West Africa. I taught in um, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Europe, all over the world. And I had a lot of experience with other cultures. So I went to my grandmother and I said, Graham, I really want to do more to help people in the world because we're getting requests and we don't have people to help them out there. And she loved the idea. So that's how the foundation got started. But one of the things that we started almost immediately, because my grandmother used to help psychics one-on-one, -on -one, um, and that just, after the movies came out, that was impossible. Um, we started two online support groups. 
for people who are sensitive. So we've got one in English and one in Spanish, and we currently have about a thousand members around the world. Wow. Well, where is in the in the well, well in the Spanish version of this foundation? It's on Facebook. If you contact okay. me on Facebook or on Instagram, I can help get you the link. It's a private group. It is only for people who believe that they are psychic or sensitive. Uh, we are very protective. We don't allow readings. Uh, we don't charge for any of our services. And we don't ever expose any of our people to the public. Uh, I've seen what publicity can do to people, and I don't want to do that to anyone. And it's free, Chris? Everything is free. Everything that the foundation does is free. We don't charge. It's God's work. We're open to donations, although I've never actually accepted any. Um, I do it with my pension. That's it. And the people that work with me, there's uh, well over a hundred of them around the world. They all volunteer their services. So every one of us pays out of pocket to help somebody in trouble. And we don't ask okay. those people to help pay those p prices normally. You know, obviously, if we've got to fly somewhere and we can't afford it, if the family can afford for us to fly there to help them, yes, we'll accept that. Uh, but that's only happened once within the foundation, and it's not something I really like. I prefer not to do that. That's why you move so much of countries? Yeah. I'm trying to learn how each culture deals with the paranormal and trying to understand how the paranormal manifests according to our own belief systems and why that might be and what that means about the nature of reality, how we can shape reality with our own minds and our own beliefs, and how important faith truly is, and what is faith, and what is God. All of those are very important, central questions to all of us, I think. And this foundation have members? Yes, we have well over 100 members around the world. Wow. In Mexico, Latin America, Unfortunately, we don't have any in Mexico. We have them throughout Latin America. Uh, we have Archbishop. Why? Nobody has applied yet that we feel would be a good fit with the foundation. We are very protective of our clients. So when somebody wants to join us, we do a complete background check. We check all their credentials because our the people we're serving come first. This isn't about yes. ego. This isn't about being famous because I've done this forever and nobody knows who I am. Um, this, is a, this is about the people we serve. And unfortunately, in the paranormal world, we do tend, to, the paranormal world attracts a lot of different kinds of people. Yes. And some of them can be very egotistical and really want to just be famous and rich. And then there are people who take this very seriously. And then there are people who kind of go down the rabbit hole and, you know, think that everything is demonic and I'm not there at all. <laughs> well, if a person wants to try to join the foundation, they go to yes. our website, uh, warrenlegacyfoundation.com. Okay. And they click on the contact us link and there's an application or you can also ask for help. There are two different things on the contact us link. It's both in English and in Spanish. So you can apply. Uh, we don't mind people who are skeptical. I'm a skeptic. Uh, oddly enough, with everything I've seen, and I am a, I'm an actual uh, exorcist. I'm a pastor. I have wow. seen things that would melt your brain. But every single case I go on, I'm skeptical. I assume that all I'm dealing with is somebody who's afraid or it's just something that's easily explained away. It's rare that it ends up becoming something really bad. Share with us a strongest uh, paranormal experience you have that made my brain. Well, here's the thing. I talk about one in particular all the time because yes. it is the most intense experience that I ever had, but it's the one I always talk about. It's my very first case when I was 16 years old. Okay. Um, in my decades of doing this, I have never had a more intense night than I did on that first night with my grandfather, uh, husband and wife that were there, and one assistant of my grandfather's, a man named Paul Bartz. We entered the house. The whole house was shaking because it was being pounded within the walls. In All the walls? Yeah, like boom, 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 wow. boom, boom, again and again. And the furniture had been flying around for weeks. The family had fled the house. There was a, two girls who had lived there as well. They were living with relatives at the time. The husband and wife wouldn't go in the house without us. 
When we went upstairs, I looked in the bathroom. The crucifix in the bathroom was turned upside down. Like this? Yeah. Yeah, wow. just like out of Hollywood. And I'm hearing growling and scratching coming from inside the walls. Wow. <laughs> and my grandfather tells me, Chris, go sit in the master bedroom in the dark and wait for something to happen. We're going to go downstairs and we're going to use holy church incense and we're going to make this thing angry so it reveals itself. I was like, it's shaking the whole house. How much more do you want it to reveal? <laughs> <laughs> Why do this your grandfather? <laughs> well, I think because when he was 16, he went into World War II. Okay. And so I was 17 and I was afraid of the dark. And he just said, yeah, no, no. We're, we're, we're going to throw him in to the pit and let him s see what it's really like. Um, so for an hour, I sat there listening to all of this stuff. And my grandfather and the people downstairs kept using the Holy Church incense downstairs in, a, in this heavy steel pot. And then they tried to bring it up the stairs and it would go out. Now, being good Catholics, you know, once that church incense gets going, it doesn't burn out quickly. But yes. it would not stay lit. It was weird. So eventually everything died down. We ended up on a radio talk show overnight on, on the telephone. And at three o'clock in the morning, my grandfather and the woman were sitting on the couch in the living room. I was on a recliner in the living room. The husband and Paul Bartz were upstairs in one of the girls' rooms on a princess phone. And we were all talking on the radio. And we were, it was dark. You couldn't see anything. And yet, three or two hulking black figures came down the stairs and stopped at the landing on the stairs looking at me and my grandfather and the woman. And we could see them even in the dark. The woman started screaming wow. that her face was on fire. And my grandfather put the flashlight on her face. And you could see three claw marks, bloody claw marks appear on her left cheek and blood come down on her chest. She started screaming, of course. Yes. Then the pot that had the church incense in it came flying out of the kitchen, around the corner, and straight at my head. It just missed me. It hit the window behind me. The shade flew up. The pot flattened, but the window didn't break. The woman started wow. screaming. She wants to get out of the house. She wants out. And I'm thinking, good idea. So I run <laughs> to the front door and the door won't open. And then the lights start going on and off all around me. And then the, the recliner I'd been just sitting in tumbles across the room toward me. The door opens by itself. My grandfather and I, or I mean, the woman and I ran out of the house, yes. leaving my grandfather sitting there on the couch, on the phone, talking about what's going on calmly. <laughs> And it's normal for, 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 for your grandfather. By that point, yes. And for me today, yeah. I mean, if a night like that happened to me, I'd be like, yeah, that's cool. But I wouldn't be terrified the way I was. That night, I was terrified out of my mind. But I went home that night or that morning. And the following night, for the first time in 16 years, I went to bed without a light on. I wasn't afraid anymore. I, I faced my fears. And it's the greatest gift my grandfather ever gave, and the greatest gift that anyone ever gave me, was learning that fear is the real enemy and that you need to face your fears, immerse yourself in your fears to overcome them. Wow, an incredible story, Chris. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, I, I've dealt with possession cases. They're very rare. They're not normal. Demons are not what people think they are. Um, but that night was absolutely over the top, the most packed with phenomena that I've ever had in one night. Never saw anything like that again. What's the really behavior of a demonic possession or a demonic presence? Well, that depends on the culture you're dealing with, because there are plenty of cultures in Latin America where they invite people, where people invite negative yes. entities to take over and ride them and deliver messages, and they have no bad effects whatsoever. I believe the reason for that, in my studies, I've noticed that every single religion, whether it be the Catholic religion or Kimbanda or whatever, yes. they, they all have rules for spirits. They all have to 
set down rules that the spirits must abide by. And if you are a believer in those in that spiritual path, and if you believe in those rules yourself, then the spirits must abide by those rules. And I think that's why possession is different in different cultures. In America and Europe, it gets out of control. It's completely out of control um, because they don't lay down any rules. And then okay. you get into the Catholic Church and the way they deal with these entities. And they, they it's all about, oh, well, we want to know their name and we've got to expel them that way. I've dealt with Catholic priests who've never been able to get the name and they've been able to expel the spirit. So I don't believe the name is necessary. I, it's not necessary in any other religion I've ever dealt with. Um, but it's a, it's a hurdle that the Catholics have put upon themselves. And again, why the, why the people believe the demo, the demonic presence have to say her name to, to they believe that it gives power over that entity. I don't even believe that these things are actually fallen spirits. Um, if you look historically at the term demon, yes, 4,000 years ago in ancient Greece, a daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N, was the go-between or the messenger between the gods and humanity. They weren't evil. If you look at um, the, the demon Garuda in the Hindu mythology, he is a demon, but he is also a winged creature that carries one of the Hindu gods to where that Hindu god needs to go. It's not evil. Heck, even when you look at the book of Job, it starts with Satan, a prince of heaven, coming into the throne of heaven and saying to God, hey, God, I hear you got this guy who's your most faithful follower. I want to test him. And God says, go right ahead. Just don't kill him. You can do anything else. Just don't kill him. So he kills his children, he kills his wife, but because Job stays faithful, Job gets it all back again. But a new wife, new children, he loses all the old ones. That doesn't seem like a very good deal for humanity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the story does show that everything is God's creation. And I believe that everything has a purpose. I think that I have found, we, we have found in the foundation that when somebody is attacked negatively by the paranormal, There is always an underlying issue that makes them vulnerable. Is it mental illness? Is it drug abuse? Is it domestic violence? Is it some past trauma that's unresolved? What's going on that we need to deal with so that we can help close that door that makes you susceptible to that negative paranormal influence? We deal with it holistically. We have to, or it doesn't work properly. And sometimes I believe that we can focus on something. For instance, the story of Annabelle. Annabelle was just a Raggedy Ann doll that was given to two nursing students by it, um, their, one of their mothers. Yes. And they, they loved this doll. And they, they carried it around the house. They sat at their dinner table with them, breakfast table with them. They went to bed with it. And then one day, the doll moves its arms up onto the table. And they thought, ooh, how cool. There must be a spirit in the doll. So they contacted a friend of theirs who said that she was a a medium and they do a series of seances eventually getting this whole backstory about a little girl named Annabelle who was killed in front of the house and is now just looking for someone to love her this is why i don't trust mediums number one i'm yes. a psychic medium Me and i don't trust any psychic without evidence because they can say something that can make somebody go off on a tangent that could get them very badly hurt or make them pay out thousands of dollars to some fraud who's promising to save them from something they don't actually have. That is so true. And th yeah, that that just that that kind of stuff just drives me nuts. Um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> It's about Annabelle. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So basically, now that they've got this story to latch on to, they're feeding Annabelle even more love, more attention, more of their human energy. And Annabelle starts responding. Annabelle starts moving from one place in the house to another place. It starts leaving messages in crayon on parchment paper around the house. Things like, miss me? Want to play? But they didn't have this old parchment paper. It's a very old fashioned kind of paper. They didn't even have crayons in the house. Now, up until that point, everything had been positive, no problem. But because 
now the girls are starting to get creeped out. They feel like something's watching them and these messages are being left and the doll's not in the same place. They're getting afraid. So now they're giving the doll negative energy. So now they're mm. turning the doll into something negative. I believe this thing, which is called a tulpa or an egregore or a, egregore. Thought, or a thought manifestation, self-manifestation of energy, it took on a life of its own. And it, just like my grandmother would say, that energy attracts energy. Positive yes. attracts positive, negative attracts negative. When you're feeding it only negative energy, you created a negative entity. I believe that's how most demons are created. I don't believe they're fallen angels. I've never seen wisdom of the ages displayed by these things. They always perform in predictable patterns of behavior. If they were truly that intelligent and invisible in energy, even if they had to follow rules, I could find a lot of ways to use those abilities much more effectively than I see these entities, this phenomena happening. Uh, it's the same thing when I talk about, people ask about demons, I say, I've never seen a demon do anything that a serial killer or a human being couldn't do worse. But so who is the devil or who is Satan? Who is this uh, entity of evil we... Uh, we have in the culture pop. Well, that's very, that's very, very Christian of you. I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't believe in Satan. Um, if you look historically again at Satan, yes. actually go back 6,000 years, there wasn't a being named Satan. There was a title called cool. uh, The Satan. And The Satan was a spiritual prosecutor who was there to test your faith. Over time, it became personified as a person, you know, and people get confused again, and they say, oh, the serpent in the garden, and that's the devil. No, there's no yes. mention of the serpent being the devil. When they talk about the devil in the New Testament, he shows up when Jesus is in the um, wilderness for 40 days, and he tempts Jesus. He's testing Jesus's faith to make sure Jesus is ready for what's about to come. To me, that seems Yes, it's negative, but for a good purpose. And sometimes I think that's what's really going on. And there is, for you, Chris, there are no fallen angels no. in this earth? No. I think there are people who are so evil, so terrible, that they can't stand to be close to the light of God. And they get lost in the darkness. And for them, they create their own hell. But do I believe in a Dante's Inferno? No. Do I believe in Revelations? No. Revelations, historically, if you study it, was written by a scribe named John who was talking about the end of the Roman Empire and how the Roman Empire would fall. That's what he was describing. And it's become this whole other thing. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't see the world ending according to one religion's blueprint. Um, I'm a pastor, but I'm a pastor without a religion. And I, okay. became this, I became this way because for 50 years I studied every religion I could, looking for faith. And I was trying to understand the mind of God. And a few years ago, there was an announcement from NASA that said, there are more living worlds in the universe than there are yes. grains of sand on Earth. And even in this one galaxy, it is estimated that there are 11 billion living planets. Yes. And when I heard that, it made me realize, here I have been waiting 50 years to understand the mind of God. And that was the most egotistical thing I could have ever thought myself possible of. <laughs> I mean, how can I? That's like the amoeba on my back, understanding what I'm going to do next week before I... Yes. You know, <laughs> God's too big. Yes. You know? Very. And I, I think of God kind of like an elephant and humanity is like three blind wise men, maybe yes. not so wise. And we're, we're touching different parts of the elephant and we get different ideas of what that elephant is. Is it a snake? Is it a tree? Is it a rope? Depending on what you're touching. And it's the same. Exactly. And I think that's God. I think there are many paths up the mountain, but God doesn't care what path you take. It doesn't matter what your religion is. What matters is, are you practicing empathy and compassion for your fellow man? Are you doing the one true commandment that I think God gave, which is, as you do unto the least of my brothers, so you do unto me. And if you, in your beliefs, who is Jesus in this history, in this humanity? 
Well, I've also studied Buddhism and Zoroastrianism and everything else. And there have been many enlightened souls. I think there are many uh, sons and daughters of God. Yes. God sends people to us. We choose through our own free will to come back. Uh, that's what the Buddhas do. The Dalai Lama, there have been 14 Dalai Lamas, all of whom are reincarnated from the same man because he keeps choosing to come back and help. It's correct. It's correct. You know, and I think that uh, Jesus is the same. He's a, he's an enlightened soul who came here giving us a message that got perverted first by Paul, um, who never met Jesus and who took his teachings and made them into a religion that could be accepted by any religion. And then by Constantine, who wanted a state religion as a way of unifying people behind him and then conquering other cultures. And then they would go into those cultures and they would literally demonize the gods and turn their gods into demons, which is why we have a lot of the demon names we do today. They're named after old gods from Sumeria and Babylonia and the Celt uh, culture. You know, so yes. yeah, that's all normal. Yes. It's Ow. fear. It's all fear, superstition. The phenomena is real. The danger is very real. I've We've had people die doing this work and die as victims of this. I've been attacked many times, um, dangerously so. So I'm not belittling it. I'm not saying it's not real. Oh, it's very, very real. Um, but I think that we're only just scratching the surface of what we're dealing with. After all of my years of doing this, I have changed my mind on what I'm dealing with so many times. I have theories, I don't have answers. And anybody who tells you they're an expert on the paranormal is lying to you. I see you in a documentary, in a platform, Netflix. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we regret that you, don't, you didn't provide a conclusion to this case. You only say the introduction, And and you don't say your conclusion of that documentary. I, I spoke you... for three or four hours on that uh, wow. documentary. They they taped an awful lot and they used very, very little. I flew up from Columbia to do that in Connecticut, in the United States. And um, it was a disappointment, I'll be honest. That was about the Conjuring 3 case, Arnie Johnson. Yes. There were allegations made about my grandparents, which are a shame. Um, but I've been seeing that since I was a kid. You know, you can't, I don't call myself a ghost hunter. My grandparents did. And, you know, you can't go around calling yourself a ghost hunter without attracting attention, bad attention. <laughs> so I yes. understand why the press was the way they were with my grandparents. But <clears throat> the stories lately have been insane. Uh, pedophilia, uh, that they were, you know, fakes and they they faked everything and they took advantage of everyone none of that's true that that's garbage um there was a producer who worked on the first conjuring movie and he got kicked off the second movie by warner brothers so he wanted to force them to either pay him more money or let him on the second movie so he came he got a hold of one of the authors of one of my grandparents books gerald brittle and a woman that used to work for my grandparents and got them to complain about my grandparents and create this whole story and it all got thrown out no nope, nothing was ever done with it um and then the uh glotzel boy the older boy he didn't believe in the case while it was going on and he never said anything to anyone until the first conjuring movie came out then he sued my grandmother for something i don't know what he lost the case he, he wanted money And then this interview came and he said that his mother was drugging him and his family. Her parents had brought them out to Hollywood, which was not true. Um, yes. They were brought out. The parents were brought out to Hollywood by a man named Dick Clark, who was a major Hollywood figure back in the day, who wanted to do a TV movie with the family, which you can watch on YouTube. As a matter of fact, it's called The Demon Murder Case with Kevin Bacon yes. and Indy Griffith. Um, but my grandparents had no involvement in that case. So, or I mean, in that movie, they didn't get paid for it. They didn't have anything to do with it. That was something the family did, which they had every right to do. So I don't know why this boy, well, grown man now, would be saying that my grandparents tricked them and brought them out to Hollywood and everything. None of that ever occurred. As a matter of fact, it's a shame because that family doesn't talk to one another anymore. And poor Arnie, the man who actually suffered from all of that stuff, as well as David Glotzel, 
you know, they both maintain it all happened. So it's just this one guy who didn't make it far in life who's disgruntled and bitter. Thank you for that comment. This program is viewed, viewed by a large Latin audience, especially young people. These topics are extremely dedicated and should never be taken lightly. Absolutely. Could you please, could you please give them some advice about this? Yeah. Yeah. This is something that makes me very upset, to be quite honest. Everybody is excited about this work. You know, it's, wow, what a cool thing to do. But they don't take into consideration, we're talking about real people's lives. You know, you want to go into an abandoned building or something like that, make sure you've told two or three people where you're going to be, when you're going to be there. Don't go in alone. Don't be that dumb. I know paranormal investigators who've gone into places by themselves, gotten very bad attachments and died. So it isn't to be taken lightly. You know, this isn't, it's Russian roulette. And when you don't know what you're doing, you're, you're playing with lives, whether it's your own life or the life of someone else. And if you're going to do this, do it properly. Contact a reputable group with a good track record. Look at their reviews. Make sure that they've actually served people and helped people. And you're always welcome to contact us. We're always looking for good people. We're always looking to mentor people. If it's in Mexico, um, until we actually have some good mentors there, that'll be a little harder. But we do have a terrific Latin American organization uh, run by Archbishop Christian Piedrejita Montoya in Bogota, mm -hmm. Colombia. He is one of the holiest men you'll ever want to meet. Um, the whole the Spanish speaking division is run by Father Ken Torres out of um, California, another fantastic individual. Um, So we have resources for you, but don't take this for granted. Don't take it lightly. Don't think of it as just fun because it isn't. You're dealing with real danger, real energy. It, it's like if you wanted to learn how to start playing with electricity or brain surgery, you're not going to just go and pick up the scalpel or, you know, start sticking metal wires into sockets to see what yes. happens. Do it with intelligence. Do it with some uh, knowledge beforehand, please. And you can always check out our YouTube channel, The Warren Files. Uh, it's a terrific resource. You're not going to find the, what was that? Kind of thing. We don't, we don't. Do that. All right. This is actual <laughs> information. This could be, this could be the thing. Yeah, we don't do, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we actually educate. You want to learn about psychic abilities. You want to learn about Sasquatch. You want to learn about how to protect yourself on a case. You want to learn about ghosts, the history of demonology, aliens, whatever it is. I'm sure we've got videos on it for you. And if we don't, let us know, because we'll probably have somebody within the foundation that could do some videos on it. Well, thank you, Chris, for this interview. My pleasure. Really, really, really. I want to thank you. Eh, for my audience, for Robin, que aquí nos, nos acompaña. Eh, and Gracias, for Chris. me, for Gracias, me, it's... Y perdóneme para <laughs> mi inglés. No, 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 <laughs> yo ahí... Entendí algunas cosas. Muchas, muchas gracias por la entrevista, Chris. Gracias. Muchas gracias a ti. Encuéntranos en todas las plataformas de podcast. Óyenos audio.